Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Global Interdependence Center's Executive Briefing. Today's event is sponsored as part of the David R. Kotak Global Healthcare Series. As a reminder, the event is being recorded and the replay and access to the slides will be available on the GIC website later today. During today's presentation, if you would like to ask a question, go to the Questions tab in the GoTo dashboard, uh, submit your question, and that will put it right into the queue. So today I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. John Newton. Dr. Newton is the Chief Economist for the American Farm Bureau Federation. It's the largest organization of independent farmers in the United States. Dr. Newton's role uh, is to manage the Farm Bureau's economics department and coordinates and conducts analyses used for the development and advocacy of Farm Bureau policy on Capitol Hill. Previously, Dr. Newton served as the agricultural economist for the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, and was detailed to both the Senate Agricultural Committee and the USDA's Chief Economist Office. Dr. Newton was an award-winning faculty member at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and he holds two masters and a PhD from The Ohio State University, and John is a native son of Kentucky. So John Newton, welcome to the GIC Executive Briefing. Thank you so much, I'm excited to be here. Uh, great to have you. So maybe we can start with some historical context. Uh, what was the state of farming and food supply and food supply chains coming into this year? And then maybe we can talk about what's changed as a result of COVID-19 and the pandemic. Perfect, Bill, and, and I'm glad that you said the uh, Ohio State University. I'm glad you put that in there. Uh, you know, Colleen, if we advance to the next slide, agriculture and the farm economy in, in 2019 was uh, fairly challenging. Uh, 2018 was challenging as well. That's when the uh, China and other countries put retaliatory tariffs on U.S. agricultural products. Uh, so we had a significant amount of demand uncertainty in 2018. Uh, that continued into 2019. And then the spring of 2019 brought about historic flooding uh, across portions of the Midwest, uh, Iowa, Missouri, and Nebraska, uh, in particular in March saw, saw historic rainfalls. Uh, that continued throughout the spring. Um, we saw 20 million acres go unplanted in 2019 due to this historic rainfall. Uh, many of the unplanted acres were in parts of the Dakotas, um, but we also saw unplanted acres in Northwest Ohio, uh, in Northern Illinois. And so when, when farmers were unable uh, to put a crop in the ground, that had a, a very significant disruption on supply uh, in 2019. Uh, if we move into the next slide, uh, what we know going into 2020 is, is many of those acres that were unplanted in 2019 uh, were obviously going to come back online. And, and in 2020, uh, we're expected to plant 92 million acres of corn, about 84 a million acres of soybeans that's up from what we saw last year given the historic flooding uh, wheat acres are projected at about 45 million acres that's the lowest uh, we've seen in about 100 years uh, cotton acres are slightly less than than 13 million acres uh, going into 2020 so we knew we were going to have uh, crop production rebound uh, this year uh, given the, the acreage that was expected to come uh, back online if we move to the next slide uh, we also were expecting going into 2020 record production uh, in red meat. Uh, pork production was expected to be a record. Uh, poultry production was also expected to be record high. Uh, and beef production, while not a record, was expected to increase uh, about 1%. So we knew we were going to have a very, very competitive uh, animal protein space. Uh, again, we knew we were going to have more crops come online uh, this year. Uh, if we have favorable weather this year, likely to be uh, record high crop yields in many cases. So 2020 was shaping up to be a year uh, in which you know, we were really hoping uh, for increased demand for U.S. agricultural products. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please. Uh, we, we needed that increased uh, demand to, to help boost farm income. Uh, in 2019, uh, farm income was Know, continues to be under pressure again due to the headwinds uh, on the trade front, uh, lower commodity prices. Uh, but in 2020, with the supplies that were coming online, it was, was very important for uh, demand 
specifically the phase one agreement with China, uh, USMCA, which went into effect uh, this week, uh, and then the US-Japan agreement. Farmers were, were looking at those three trade agreements uh, to hopefully boost demand in 2020 and help boost farm income. Uh, USDA projected for farm income in 2020, uh, while it's still uh, well below what we saw back in 2013 and 2014, uh, they projected net farm income to increase about 3% or $3 billion uh, from 2019. So farmers were optimistic that 2020 was going to be a slightly better year uh, in terms of farm profitability. If we move to the next slide. I think the optimism that, that farmers and ranchers had really on the back of the three uh, new trade agreements where you know we we effectively renegotiated trade uh, in 50 percent of our markets that we do business in around the world uh, that light that we saw in, at the end of the tunnel turned out to be a freight train uh, in in mid-march when coronavirus cases began to accelerate uh, in the united states we saw and everyone's very familiar with this at, at this point uh, but the stay-at-home orders the social distancing uh, had an immediate impact on the farming community uh, not only did we see disruptions in the supply chain, but we had challenges uh, making sure that we had access to, to the, the labor we needed uh, to harvest the winter fruit and vegetables and plant the spring crops. Uh, we worked very closely with the State Department to make sure that the H-2A visas, uh, those guest workers coming into Mexico were, were allowed to continue and viewed as essential workers uh, as, as the visa applications uh, were, were halted at the embassy. So. Uh, that was probably the first major thing that we worked on when COVID-19 happened. Uh, and then the second thing, the supply chain disruption. You have farmers uh, that grow particularly for the restaurant and business. Uh, for example, you know, in Idaho, Idaho potatoes, uh, many of those potatoes are destined for uh, French fries, frozen French fries and food service. Well, as soon as restaurants began to close, they canceled those orders. So you had producers with potatoes with nowhere to go uh, with in that market. Uh, you had dairy farmers where they were supplying plants that were making products specifically uh, for restaurants, be it large volumes of, of mozzarella cheese, uh, uh, products for export, like dry whey powders. Uh, those plants, the, the lines weren't fabricated to, to make uh, packaging for consumer size uh, goods. And so you saw farmers had to dump milk across the country because they didn't have a home for it. Uh, poultry plants, uh, you know, we had to depopulate birds and pigs uh, as, as we saw COVID-19 shut down those manufacturing facilities as well due to workers getting sick. So a, a number of challenges uh, with COVID-19 impacted uh, the farming and ranchers uh, across the country. Uh, if we move to the next slide, and the primary reason for that was more than 50% of the food consumed in the United States. We spent nearly $2 trillion on food in 2018, uh, but more than 50% of that was spent outside of the home. So we, we were unable to just take the, the restaurant and food service dollar, the school, school consumption of food and agricultural products, and move it through the, the grocery channel. We simply just, uh, our supply chain wasn't fabricated to do that. And so those are uh, the supply chain disruptions that we saw was a direct result of how much uh, food was actually consumed outside the home. If we hey, move John, to the next slide. Yeah. John, let me interrupt for one second, because I know you've done some research and publication on the U.S. food supply chain, all right? And and that agricultural supply chain is really about just-in-time inventory. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe, in the question, but could you just talk a little bit, how do you think the supply, the supply chain may change as a result of uh, of the pandemic? You know, that's a that's an interesting question. When you think about, uh, you know, when consumers go to the grocery store and grab a gallon of milk, that, that milk is probably only a few days removed uh, from the farm. Uh, and, and you think about bacon, for example, uh, all the whole life cycle of raising that hog, getting it uh, fed and getting it finished and delivered to market, again, a just-in-time system such that when you deliver market ready hogs, another uh, another round comes right into those barns uh, to get fed out uh, until they're market ready. So, you know, in terms of thinking about our supply chain moving forward, uh, you know, it, it's a question of whether or not we're going to build in the redundancies, build in extra uh, processing capacity 
in the event that there's another COVID-19 disruption. Uh, we did see plants add uh, extra shifts, uh, primarily to make sure that the processing facilities were adequately cleaned and sanitized, uh, but they were running overtime to make sure that you're processing these animals. I think it's a function of whether or not that's efficient to have uh, you know, some shock absorbers uh, in the supply chain moving forward. You could have, uh, you could move towards smaller processing facilities, uh, but there's gonna be a cost associated with that. Uh, so I think the economies of scale that we see in the, in the agriculture and food industry, uh, for example, four large meat packers in the United States, uh, those efficiencies that they've gained uh, has allowed food to be very affordable in the United States. If we uh, build in some of those redundancies, somebody's gonna have to pay for it along the supply chain and it's likely to be the consumer. So I, I think there's going to be a lot of research, Bill, uh, supply chain research at the universities to think about you know, what that optimization model looks like in terms of uh, planning for uh, these type of demand disruptions that we saw from COVID-19. One of the other things that we could also see is, is increased automation uh, in these facilities um, to, to deal with you know, any potential worker illnesses. So uh, I think we're going to continue to evaluate that and study that as we as we get to the other side of this thing. Great, uh, thank you. Colleen, could we move to the next slide, please? Uh, as, as indicated, you know the challenges in the you know in the supply chain in the grocery space. Uh, we saw in, in March uh, when you look at Census Bureau data. Uh, grocery store sales were a record $73 billion. Uh, they declined slightly in April, but jumped back up in May to $67 billion. Uh, meanwhile, food service uh, declined by as much as 50% from February to April. Uh, it did rebound slightly uh, in, in May uh, to about $41 billion. But collectively, uh, when you look at the three-month period between March and May, uh, we had $50 billion less in expenditures on, on food and agricultural products uh, through the grocery store and food service channel. So many people thought, well, people still need to eat, so it's not gonna have an impact on agriculture, but that's not the case. You, you had significant disruption and that ultimately impacted uh, farmers and, and you know, where they send their product. We move to the next slide. Uh, the, the impact uh, to the consumer was, was uh, immediate. Uh, you know, you think about the the grocery stores. <laughs> that's, the, that's the FedEx delivery man. <laughs> well guarded, that's okay. Uh, we saw when we had all the consumers move into uh, the grocery store, you know, many of the retailers would run uh, promotions to get consumers in the door. Uh, and, and we saw those promotions, you didn't need to do that when you had that amount of foot traffic moving through uh, the grocery chain. And then we also saw, uh, you know, panic buying. So we saw, you know, increases, uh, inflation, egg prices were up 20% year over year. Uh, ground beef was up 17% year over year. Uh, chicken, 8%. So a variety of products were, were higher in prices for the consumers uh, due to all that traffic moving through uh, the grocery store. I would expect that inflation uh, to continue uh, in the short run. I think in the longer run, you know, food price inflation has been relatively stable uh, in the United States. Uh, and so I think we're going to move back uh, to, to the more affordable food. I think the only thing that would uh, maybe lead this inflation to continue uh, would be, you know, any additional costs with getting PPE equipment in the food processing facilities, uh, things of that nature. But we have ample supplies of food. There are no shortages of food around the United States. It's just a, a matter of, of kind of re- uh, reallocating the supply chain. If we move to the next slide, please. Uh, we did see, uh, you know, beginning in, in late March, uh, you know, many workers were afraid to go to the meat processing plants and they didn't want to get sick. Uh, but we did start to see workers get sick in the meat processing plants and, and many of those would uh, go idle uh, for a two week period so they could be properly sanitized and the workers could quarantine. Uh, so on the on the cattle side, we saw at one point in time cattle slaughter was down more than 30 percent weekly cattle slaughter. Uh, it has started to recover. Uh, the president signed an executive order 
uh, directing personal protective equipment into these meat processing plants. Uh, so as of last week, cattle slaughter was back to uh, year ago levels, uh, but it did take some time to, to get there. Uh, we saw the same disruption on the hog supply chain uh, where weekly slaughter was down as much as 30 to 40% uh, compared to 2019. And, and as those facilities has, have reopened, uh, they, they start to move more animals through there and, and hog slaughter was uh, up 11% compared to year ago levels. Uh, there's still a backlog of animals that need to be processed. When you think about uh, in 2020, we were expecting record uh, red meat and dairy production. Uh, so there's still animals that need to move through that supply chain. Uh, but that was a very, very significant disruption. Uh, at one point in April, I believe the CEO of Smithfield said that, that we will have meat shortages uh, in the United States. And I think the livestock industry, these meat, these meat processing plants have bounced back much quicker than anyone uh, anticipated. We move to the next slide, please. Across the, the broader uh, sector, we saw a lot of increased price volatility. These are all futures prices uh, for agricultural products. Uh, beginning in uh, you know, January 15th, moving into March, uh, commodity prices began to move lower. Uh, I think January 15th was when the phase one agreement with China was signed. Uh, and, and even though that agreement was signed, we still saw commodity prices moving lower. I think many in the industry didn't believe that Chinese would live up to their phase one commitments. Uh, so we didn't see a, a sharp increase in commodity prices. Uh, but by mid, mid March and April, as, as we were at the height of the stay at home orders, uh, many of your protein products saw very sharp price declines. Uh, milk prices were down as much as 30%. Uh, cattle prices were down as much as 30%. Ethanol, uh, which really moves with the oil market. Uh, those prices were down sharply. Uh, and, and since that point in time, if states have started to reopen, uh, milk prices are now 30% higher uh, than where they were at the beginning of the year. Uh, we did see a lot of volatility in the rice market, uh, and that was due to uh, the short crop we had last year due to the weather events I talked about earlier, uh, but also we had a lot of Inst you know, speculative money moving into that rice futures contract. Uh, so a lot of volatility there. But you can see just about every agricultural commodity that's traded uh, has suffered increased price volatility uh, due to COVID-19. And uh, circle out hogs in particular, uh, hog prices continue to be under significant amount of pressure uh, because there's a lot of animals ready for processing. So there's, you know, there's only so much processing capacity we have more animals ready to go to market and that's put uh, downward pressure on the lean hog price. Uh, if we move to the next slide. And, and John, before we leave that slide, if we could just go back to that one second. Um, okay. So we've got uh, two questions from viewers that are, I think, tied into this particular graphic. Um, one, I think you've addressed it, right? There's food inflation and then there's food inflation expectations and, and you've said you you think expectations for food prices will be higher going forward uh, could you address a little bit more detail why and then a related question when you're looking at these futures prices right these are these are price signals yeah. how are farmers responding to these changing price signals so i i would think that that retail food prices are going to moderate that inflation is going to moderate just because we have ample supplies uh, of, of you know we have plenty of uh, feed stock uh you know plenty of uh, red meat plenty of dairy products so i think that that inflation is going to moderate i don't think we'll continue to see those type of prices through the rest of the year uh, in terms of how do farmers respond uh, to these price signals you know farmers are constantly making marketing and, and risk management decisions and so uh, when you look at the the corn price for example farmers are going to compare that uh, to the soybean price they're going to look at the you know, expected returns per acre uh, for those commodities and, and make an acreage and, and rotational decision uh, based on those price expectations. Uh, things like, uh, you know, milk, that's more of a, a flow commodity. It's produced every day. Cows need to get milked uh, multiple times per day. You can adjust your production dramatically uh, in response to price signals. Uh, and, and there's an adage in the, in the dairy industry, actually, uh, and I'll ask you this question, Bill. Uh, what do you think farmers do when milk prices are high? I would think they would make more. They'd make more milk, right? 
And what do you think dairy farmers do when milk prices are low? I would think they they'd make, make less. Milk. They make more milk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think I think dairy is one of the few that that doesn't really respond uh, very well to price signals at the farm level. But uh, farmers, you know, do you know? It, I think the more challenging thing is, uh, you know, if you if you have if you're raising livestock and you're not a, a diversified operation. Uh, you're not going to make a decision to stop feeding cattle and, and try to plant corn or uh, another crop on that ground. It's those that's a costly in, investment decision to change your operational uh, structure like that. But in terms of row crops, they can alter their crop rotation a little bit based on price signals. Uh, maybe try to grow a, a specialty crop, things of that nature. Great. If we move to the next slide. When, I, when you look, USDA has, has expectations of, of crop production and crop value. Uh, they released these monthly supply and demand estimates. Um, we look at, at before coronavirus and after coronavirus, uh, many of the top commodities uh, have seen very, very significant price uh, declines, not only for this year, but also going into next year uh, on the broiler, uh, poultry side for chickens. Uh, we had, uh, you know, Many of those poultry plants would shut down due to COVID-19. Uh, so you saw uh, poultry production decline, uh, and the revenue for poultry is down about $14 billion. Uh, on the milk side, lower milk prices have contributed to uh, uh, a revenue decline of $9 billion over two years. Uh, corn, uh, due to the ethanol uncertainty, we're looking at uh, the old crop and the new crop. The new crop is what's going in the ground this spring and will be harvested. Uh, this fall, a revenue decline of about eight billion. Uh, beef down six billion. So in total, about fifty billion for just some of the top commodities. Uh, and this doesn't include specialty crops. It doesn't include fruits and vegetables. Uh, it doesn't include aquaculture. Uh, it doesn't include nurseries or specialty livestock. So when you look across the whole uh, agricultural sector, the the losses uh, due to COVID-19 are, are pretty significant. If we move to the next slide, uh, to, to help uh, the agricultural community uh, kind of bridge the gap with respect to coronavirus, uh, Congress passed the CARES Act. Uh, and the CARES Act, you know, a $2 trillion package, uh, agriculture received uh, about 0.5% of that uh, in, in, through the office of the secretary. So USDA was provided with $9.5 billion dollars. And they combined that with some existing resources and they announced a $16 billion direct payment program uh, to provide financial assistance to cattle producers, dairy producers, uh, corn, cotton, soybean, et cetera, uh, that saw price declines due to COVID-19. So to help them bridge the gap. Uh, the CARES Act also provided an additional $14 billion to USDA's Commodity Credit Corporation. Uh, that Sorry, I, something happened on my computer. Uh, that money is expected to be uh, made available in July, so USDA can craft uh, additional uh, aid packages to help producers that uh, continue to be impacted by uh, COVID-19. If we move to the next slide. Uh, so far, uh, through the first month of sign-up uh, for uh, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, uh, $5.4 billion in direct payments have been made. Uh, that's about an average of $15,000 per producer. Uh, Iowa so far leads the country at, at about $570 million. Uh, but you can see a lot of the money is, is concentrated uh, in row crop heavy uh, areas, in livestock intensive areas. Iowa is one of the leading uh, pork producers, for example, uh, in areas with a lot of cattle feeders and in, in, in a lot of dairy farmers also receiving significant amount of assistance there. Uh, these direct payments are limited to $250,000 per applicant or as much as $750,000 per operation. Uh, so there is a significant amount of direct payment support going out to farmers and ranchers. Uh, currently, they can sign up for this program through the end of August. If we move to the next slide, please. Uh, all of this is happening after we've already seen farm bankruptcies continue to accelerate. So in the last 12 months, uh, farm bankruptcies were up about 23% uh, compared to the previous 12-month period. 
Uh, the reason why farm bankruptcies continue to increase is, is we're in the eighth year of a down farm economy uh, with low commodity prices, uh, only made worse by, by headwinds we face on the trade front. So I would anticipate that the COVID-19 uh, you know, market disruptions that we've seen, uh, the high unemployment rates that we've seen across the country uh, will ultimately uh, lead more farmers to, to, to seek Chapter 12 uh, family farm bankruptcy uh, relief. If we move to the next slide, uh, you know, talking about the the employment situation, the reason why we we focus on that is many farmers, uh, especially many of your medium to small size farmers across the country, often rely on one or two uh, sources of off farm income. So when you see unemployment rise, uh, that's when farmers have a, a very difficult time servicing uh, what amounts to be a, a a record farm debt. Farm debt's $425 billion uh, in the United States. And so when when people lose their jobs, they the delinquencies increase. Uh, and I think that's going to ultimately have an impact on uh, farm bankruptcies and, and on the farm economy uh, moving forward. If we move to the next slide, please. Kind of shifting gears a little bit. We talked uh, we talked about this bill when in our prep call. You know, when we talk about food price inflation, uh, even though, uh, you know, food price inflation has moved up about four to five percent over the last year, uh, Americans still spend the least amount of money on food consumed at home uh, of all the countries uh, in the world. You can see U.S. Uh, there. We spend about five percent of our disposable income on food consumed at home. So uh, very food secure here in the United States. So I think even if we see. Uh, slightly higher food prices here, we're, we're still going to spend a small portion of our disposable income on food uh, here in the United States. If we move to the next slide. And sorry, John, if I can go back to that slide for just one second. We, we do have a couple of questions uh, about the global nature of food supply chain and, and food insecurity. Mm -hmm. um, one viewer is asking, can you speak to how the Northern Hemisphere may be able to help address or eliminate the food insecurity in the southern hemisphere that's that's one question you want to try that one yeah sure so one of the things that you know we've been working on for the last year and a half to two years is we've actually partnered with uh, the bill and melinda gates foundation uh, to to increase uh, you know awareness of food insecurity around the country around the world i'm sorry and what we can do to address that and and one of the things that we often advocate for is, is increased uh, funding for ag research so that we can continue uh, to, to make more weather resistant crops uh, so that food can be produced in some of these food insecure countries. Uh, addressing science-based agriculture, ag technology, uh, being more efficient is one of the ways that, that we can help those uh, food insecure countries. Uh, we saw uh, this week, uh, the USTR uh, announced that they're going to enter negotiations with Kenya on a free trade agreement. Uh, so I think getting uh, the African countries uh, to be more acceptable of, of science-based practices in agriculture, accepting the seed uh, seed varieties that we have in the United States will go a long way to addressing the food insecurity that they have. And, and that was our second question asking about the African continent and you know, if there's any statistics or data that you have, Kenya, I think, is a good example. But any other color on how the food supply is playing out as a result of the pandemic in, in Africa? No, I haven't looked at, 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 at that in particular. I know there were concerns that, that many countries would have, uh, you know, export embargoes to limit and keep their food supply uh, domestically. I think uh, last week, Russia said they're going to have a, a grain export embargo for portions of the year so they can secure their domestic supply before they begin to, to export. So I think uh, that would be something to continue to monitor is whether or not uh, countries prohibit exporting food products uh, for national security interests. I think that could have a big impact on some of those food insecure countries, but I think more research there would be needed, Bill. Great. If we move to the next slide. Uh, the, the CARES Act also uh, increased money for uh, nutrition programs here in the United States. Uh, so we do have the, the SNAP program that provides uh, money to households across the country to buy uh, certain food products. We spend 
uh, about 60 to 70 billion dollars a year uh, on this SNAP program and the CARES Act uh, provided uh, a boost in funding for child nutrition and supplemental nutrition programs uh, to help people, uh, consumers that were impacted by COVID-19, help them to continue to get access uh, to food. USDA also had a Farmers to Food Box program uh, at $3 billion uh, where people could submit bids to USDA to buy uh, vegetables, fruit and vegetables, processed meat and dairy products, uh, put them in the food boxes and distribute it uh, to needy needy households. So uh, there are efforts here in the United States to, to A, uh, get some of that surplus food that was going through the restaurant channel to consumers that need it, uh, address food waste by, by moving that product uh, through innovative new food distribution programs. But we also have expanded uh, SNAP funding so that low-income households can continue to get access uh, to food. If we move to the next slide, uh, I think we're, we're likely to see, given the, the you know, unemployment situation, more households are going to need to depend on SNAP. Uh, SNAP participation had fallen in recent years on the back of a strong economy, uh, but I think given uh, the likely recession that we find ourselves in, we're going to see uh, more households relying on, on the SNAP program uh, to, to get access to, to food products. So I think that's going to continue to accelerate. Uh, SNAP is authorized through the Farm Bill. We do the Farm Bill every five years. Uh, the Farm Bill is a 10-year, $1 trillion package, uh, and about 80% of the money in the Farm Bill is, is designed for these nutrition programs. So I think we're going to continue uh, to see that usage uh, expand in the, in the coming years. If we move to the next slide, please. Uh, going back to, to you know the, my concern on unemployment and off-farm income and, and folks having one or two off-farm jobs, uh, the last time we saw off-farm income fall dramatically during the recession, I talked to many of the lenders in the farm credit community, uh, and that's when farm loan delinquencies rose. Uh, they were above 3%. Uh, back in 2009 and 10, uh, because people had lost off-farm income, they had problems servicing uh, their debt. Uh, we also saw farm bankruptcies uh, at that point in time uh, were at the highest level that they had been in the last decade. And so moving forward with the high levels of unemployment, I think we're going to see off-farm income uh, likely take a hit. I just pulled the, the most recent data uh, from the call reports and farm loan delinquencies in the, in the first quarter. Uh, we're at 2.8 percent on farm real estate so it's starting to climb and i think it's only going to climb uh, more uh, due to covid 19 challenges that we face if we move so to the John, next slide uh, yeah. we've got two questions related to this this slide and and on the bankruptcy front so um, one question is will the increase in farm bankruptcies uh, affect the supply or how will it affect the supply and there's a question about, will those farms be taken out of production? And how, how has that worked in the past? How long are they yeah. offline, if you will? Well, generally what happens, uh, you know, when a farm goes out of business, those assets are liquidated. Another farmer may buy it. Uh, in the case of cropland, if the farmer's not farming it, somebody else may come in and, and rent or purchase that ground. So I don't think you're gonna see a significant change in production or food availability uh, due to, you know, Chapter 12 farm bankruptcies. Uh, you know, like you think about a dairy farm, when it goes out of business, they may sell the cows to another dairy farm. So milk production in that example doesn't change. Mm. Uh, so so I don't think we're going to see any type of food disruptions uh, due to this. But it's, you know, it is a farm family that is having to restructure their debt. I think uh, Chapter 12 uh, bankruptcies have a success rate of about 75%. Uh, so there are some that that their chapter 12 uh, denied by the court or, or doesn't uh they're not able to successfully restructure and pay that debt so uh but, but it is a concerning statistics i think it's also important to put in context uh, farm bankruptcies were about 10 times higher in the 1980s uh, than they were today and even though we're in a challenging farm economy uh, one of the things that that's helped agriculture throughout uh you know, the last eight years or so, uh, it's very, very strong land land prices. Real estate prices in agriculture have been uh, almost bulletproof, Bill, uh, with low interest rates and low turnover of farmland. Uh, those assets have remained pretty strong. That helps to keep the debt to asset ratio 
uh, in a manageable level. And I don't think we're going to see much pressure on land prices in the immediate future as long as we see interest rates uh, as low as they are today. So uh, we have a $3 trillion asset base uh, with about $425 billion in farm debt. That gives us a debt to asset ratio about 15, 13 to 15%. So uh, that, that land base, I think, is what's helped people weather this storm more than anything. So I want to get to agricultural trade, but before I do, uh, a, a couple of investment related questions from participants. Um, it, on this slide, talking about the bankruptcy and what you just said about the context of the, the farming industry, is this having, uh, how's this going to impact uh, companies that supply farms? This could be phosphate companies like Mosaic, or maybe the implementation uh, companies uh, for tractors and combines and things of that nature. Probably an unfair question for you, but I don't know if you have no, a view. It's it's perfect. I, I think when you think about the the phosphate fertilizer companies, I mean, we're still going to plant 90 million acres of corn, right? 80 million acres of soybeans. Uh, I think principal crop acreage is 300 million acres in the United States. That ground's going to get farmed. Uh, so the demand, I think, is there. I think the challenge we saw in the case of Mosaic uh, is, is really related to COVID-19. I think it, it has an impact on uh, the corn price. Corn prices have fallen sharply due to ethanol uh, demand uncertainty. And I think that that's brought down uh, the value of Mosaic uh, with it, uh, given that, that so much phosphorus is used uh, on corn ground across the country. On, on some of the other, you know, ag machinery, you know, there's a couple things to look at. One is, you know, as these farms go out of business, what we've seen over the last few decades is what I call a, a shrinking middle. And that means the small farms, maybe those that don't have as much debt or, or don't have any debt are able to continue. Uh, the medium sized operations, you either got to get big and capture those economies of scale or you're going to have, you know, a real challenge in this kind of low price environment. So we see more and more of those medium-sized farm operations. Uh, we're losing those, and, and that has a, an impact on these machinery dealers because if you have fewer farms, uh, it's going to impact the demand for uh, farm machinery. At the same time, lower commodity prices means uh, maybe producers don't buy a new tractor every three years. Maybe they go into the used uh, equipment, or they. So, so I think the the dealers are having to rethink. Uh, you know, how to get farm equipment to producers. You're seeing more uh, long-term warranties on, on farm equipment because farmers are keeping them longer. So I think the business model is, is shifting, uh, but that's something that they definitely pay attention to, uh, Bill. So um, on that point, one of our board members is asking, can you put in dollar terms the, uh, the scale of the uh, big big agro industry as opposed to uh, individual farms? So I think one thing that's important to, to note is 98% of farms in the United States are family farmers. There's this notion that there's these these massive factory farms out across the country. Uh, but, but I think, you know, again, 98% are family farmers, uh, but there are farms, uh, you know, in the Midwest, folks that may farm 20,000 acres. Uh, whereas the average grain farm in Illinois probably farms anywhere between two and 4,000 acres. The average dairy farm is 200 cows in the United States, but there are farmers that have 30 to 50,000 animals on multiple sites. So I think, you know, your large scale pr producers in the country, I think about 20% of the farmers produce 80% of the food is, is kind of the rule of thumb that, that folks point to. Great. So why don't we, uh, in the interest of time, maybe we can jump forward into uh, uh, trade and, sure. and talk yeah. about exports and, and what's happening there. Sure, and I, I think that's how uh, Mr. Kotak first found me was uh, farm bankruptcies and the phase one agreement with China. So it's it's fitting that we, we kind of step into that realm uh, right now. So if we move to the next slide, uh, let's, move, let's move forward again. Let's move up to trade. Uh, so uh, let's, we'll start here and, and uh, through the first you know, five months of the year, U.S. agricultural trades down about 4%. Uh, China, exports to China are up about $500 million currently, uh, but that's from a, a pretty low uh, 2019 and low 2018. So don't be misled by 
China buying 500 million more in, in agricultural products. I think what's interesting is, is Canada and Mexico uh, both down pretty sharply in terms of their uh, purchases of agricultural products. So we continue to face uh, headwinds on the trade front around the world. I think a strong dollar also hurts our competitive position as an exporter. So, uh, you know, we had hoped and we hope that USMCA will turn this around. We'll have better access uh, in Canada for wheat, dairy, and poultry products. Uh, but Canada and Mexico have long been our top markets for agriculture uh, alongside China, Japan, and, and South Korea. If we move to the next slide. Uh, everyone, however, you know, in the last, you know, two years been focused on China and, and the phase one agreement that was signed January 15th on the ag front, uh, China's to buy $12.5 billion more in agricultural products in 2020. That's on top of a 2017 baseline of $24 billion. So that puts their purchase commitment uh, in 2020 at $36.5 billion. And where we are through the first five months of the year, China's bought slightly more than $5 billion. So they're about $25 billion behind the pace they need uh, to meet their phase one commitments. And, and I say 25 because I throw in about 15% of that for insurance and freight. So uh, they need to accelerate their purchases of, of agricultural products uh, through the, the back half of this year. Uh, many people say that China's purchases for ag are gonna accelerate uh, in the fourth quarter and that coincides with uh, soybean harvest here in the United States. But uh, Brazil's exported, Brazil's our main competitor on the soybean front, and they've exported a record amount of soybeans so far this year. Uh, they continue uh, to be the number one supplier of soybeans in the Chinese market. So there's a lot of competition uh, to get into that Chinese market. Uh, and, and right now we're, we're certainly lagging our phase one uh, purchase commitments. If we move to the next slide, to kind of put that in a you know a monthly perspective, uh, you know by December we probably need to export more than 31 billion dollars uh, to China to meet the phase one commitment. And if you look at our seasonal pace, uh, we usually export about 75 percent of our products uh, to China in the fourth quarter and then in the first quarter of the next year. So we need to see purchases accelerate uh, and accelerate in a big way. Uh, to meet our phase one uh, commitment. We're right now about 50% uh, below the needed pace uh, to meet the, the phase one commitment. And I think most people, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a pretty Herculean effort to get to that point uh, in terms of meeting that phase one agreement. I think we may have some infrastructure challenges on, on actually being to export that amount of product in the fourth quarter. Uh, it, it could certainly cannibalize our sales to other trade partners too. Uh, if China does come in and, and actually buy that amount of product um, in the fourth quarter. But again, it's going to be a, a Herculean effort for them to, to meet this commitment. We move to the next slide. Uh, the, the administration, you know, we talked about the direct payments with respect to the coronavirus, uh, but we also had direct payments go out to producers uh, related to trade. Uh, in 2019, about $15 billion in trade payments were made. Uh, to producers. Uh, Iowa got 1.6 billion in direct payments, Illinois at, at 1.4 billion. So I think most folks are looking at the phase one agreement and, and there's some thought uh, in the ag community that uh, if China doesn't live up to the phase one purchase commitments and the president has tweeted uh, that he would, he would do another direct payment program uh, to help the farmers if China uh, doesn't step up to the plate. So given that this is an election year i think many people are going to be watching that phase one commitment uh and, and especially the impact on the agricultural community moving forward so john we've got three questions tied to uh, what you just said in this particular slide uh, the first one someone's asking what percentage of farm income is actually tied to government support you know his it's you know in 2019 it was it was pretty big. Uh, I, I want to say it, it may have been uh, in terms of gross receipts it's small. It might be four or five percent in terms of total cash receipts. Uh, but in terms of farm profit it was probably closer to 30 percent last year uh, due to the trade payments. So we had trade payments last year. There's normal farm bill payments. So 
farm bill is authorized every five years and it has some risk management programs for farmers uh, that are more price-based or revenue-based programs. Uh, so if, for example, a farm bill program doesn't give you a, a direct subsidy every year, uh, we got rid of those in the in the 14 farm bill, but instead it will say if the corn price, for example, falls below 370, the national average price falls below 370, then you'll get a payment for the difference. Uh, so that's how the, the farm programs work today. They're not direct subsidies, but more uh, market-based assistance to help folks when prices or revenue uh, is pretty low. But I think in 2019, it was a, a big percentage of farm profitability. It's likely to be the same uh, in 2020, given the, the CFAP uh, payments that we've received uh, so far this year. So the second question in, in your research, have you been able to link what those different subsidies, uh, how they affect commodity prices? So that's a, that's a good question too. So the, the 1996 Farm Bill uh, did what's called decoupling uh, farm program payments from what farmers actually produced. So prior to that, if you wanted to get a payment for wheat, you had to plant wheat. And so we decoupled farm programs. So now farmers, uh, and it's getting into the weeds a little bit, but you can historically have grown wheat, you can plant soybeans, uh, but if wheat prices fall, you may get a payment for wheat. So they're allowed to plant for the market. Uh, I, I don't believe that farm program payments uh, distort market prices. I think uh, they're all uh, made uh, after the fact in most cases. Uh, so do not uh, influence acreage decisions that, that farmers uh, do across the country. Great. And then our third question, uh, going back to policy, can you please compare and contrast uh, agricultural policy under a Biden administration versus a second term for the current administration? So, I, and, and we can move forward a slide, I'll, I think. I'll try to, in the purpose of time, uh, kind of highlight one point. Uh, so if we can move forward. Let's move forward again. This is a good, this is a good slide to kind of highlight that. I, I think what we've seen, uh, you know, from the Democrats uh, is, is a lot of emphasis on sustainability and climate. And I think, you know, if we see a Biden administration, I think they're, they're could be renewed interest on, uh, if you think back to Obama, uh, cap and trade, uh, there could be more emphasis on, on climate. And I think for agriculture, uh, you think about U.S. agriculture only represents about nine to 10% uh, of total greenhouse gas emissions uh, here in the U.S. So we are already uh, have a very, very low uh, environmental footprint. And that doesn't even take into consideration our carbon sequestration efforts uh, where we're able to trap carbon in the soil. But I think uh, a Biden administration is going to have much more of an emphasis on climate and how agriculture can be part of that solution. Uh, we did see a bill uh, last month uh, by Senators Braun and Stabenow to create, uh, uh, have USDA kind of be the former evaluator of uh, how much carbon farmers are capturing in the soil. So I think we'll continue to move that direction under Biden. Uh, I think under the Trump administration, we'll probably see continued efforts to deregulate. Uh, I think the president's come to the Farm Bureau Convention three straight years. And when he came in in 2017, he said for every new regulation, he's gonna get rid of two. Uh, and when he came to our convention, he said for new every new regulation, they got rid of 22. So I think a Trump administration is gonna continue on the on the regulatory front, trying to uh, remove uh, regulations, whereas I think the Bidens are, are probably gonna put more emphasis on uh, you know, climate and, and that'll bring with it more regulations. And I think in the interest of time, Bill, I, you know, I can wrap up here and we can take more questions if you'd like. Yeah, we've got a, a couple more in the queue. So if you wanna uh, just do a couple of finishing comments and then we'll wrap up with some questions. Yeah, so the, I guess to, to wrap up, uh, you know, the, the, the whole presentation, the farm economy was, you know, already in pretty tough shape. It's been in tough shape since uh, 2013, 2014. 
you know, commodity prices have been low. Farmers are, are you know, facing uncertainty on the trade front. Uh, there's been a significant amount of government support to help producers uh, weather the trade war, the retaliatory tariffs, uh, and then assistance to help farmers uh, deal with the uh, coronavirus. I think given where commodity prices are today, uh, it's likely that, that more assistance is going to be needed. Uh, but even with more financial assistance, I think we're still going to see uh, increased Chapter 12 bankruptcy filings. But we'll be able to weather uh, the storm ultimately because we've got a pretty strong asset base. Land values uh, continue to be pretty strong across the country, and that certainly helps uh, producers moving forward. And I think you know what what we've been engaged with, you know, in recent years with uh, others in the agribusiness community, with consumers uh, and investors, is more conversations on climate uh, and, and more conversations on sustainability, social sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability. And, and I think we're already pretty good stewards in many of those areas. But I think there'll be renewed focus uh, after we get past coronavirus to, to do more on those fronts. And, and agriculture is uniquely positioned on the environmental side to do that, uh, but there'll be efforts on uh, social sustainability, how do we treat our workers, how do we treat our livestock, and, and we'll continue to provide that transparency. So uh, I think with that, Bill, I'll conclude my remarks and, and look forward to any additional questions. Great. Thank you, John. So um, we have a question here. You had made a comment about uh, meat processing plants and along the supply chain uh, firms buying uh, protective equipment and PPE. What are the one or two, th the question from uh, our board member is, what are one or two things that can be done to protect supply chains from the next wave or other threats? Well, I think certainly the, the PPE uh, is, is helpful, making sure that you're directing those resources to those plants. Uh, I think proper cleaning of those facilities. So I've done a good job showing people how they've kind of refabricated their plants to ensure social distancing, uh, make sure workers have all the, the right equipment. So we need to do that first and foremost to protect uh, the supply chain. I think the second thing is, is think about how we can more quickly uh, respond to any potential disruptions, uh, whether that means you know refabricating a line uh, whether that means bringing in more automation, but those are more longer term challenges. Uh, Great. So uh, thank you for that. Here's a question on sustainable energy. There's a body of research showing that farmers can make multiples more per acre by leasing the land for uh, wind turbines than they can growing uh, their own ethanol inputs. Any thoughts on how that might influence future trends? You, um, <laughs> the folks that, that have a wind turbine on their farm out in Indiana are making uh, quite a bit of money. Uh, they're doing they're doing fairly well. Uh, I think it's a function of you know you, you can't take all that cropland and turn it into wind turbines. Uh, there's you have areas of the country that are uniquely situated to put these wind farms, and and where they're there, uh, you know, farmers are leasing that ground to put in those uh, those wind turbines but around those turbines there's still plenty of corn and soybeans so uh, I think it's it's part of diversification in that farm's portfolio and that they may have some some revenue that comes there but also their traditional uh, revenue from the agricultural products they raise thank you so uh, someone asked, can you speak to how agriculture is impacting ESG investing? That's environmental, social, and governance investing. Or conversely, how ESG investing is impacting farming? You know, whether we're sitting down and talking with, uh, you know, a major food company, uh, an investment company, one of the first things they always ask is, is on sustainability. What are what are you doing? Are you are you doing cover crops? You know, how are you protecting the water? How are you protecting the soil? Uh, they ask about how you're, you're treating the workers. Uh, so it's you know it's impacting uh, farmers across the country, uh, and it's I think the challenge we have is farmers can do all of these these extra sustainability measures. It's it's a function of got to make it economically sustainable. So for example, if a company wants 
you to sequester more carbon and, and demonstrate that? Well, it costs money to buy cover crops. Uh, and with low commodity prices, the economics of putting additional cover crops on the ground aren't there unless uh, that that company or or consumers willing to pay a premium for that product. So uh, I think that's that's the question that we continue to uh, face on the environmental and social sustainability front is uh, we've got a there's a willingness to pay for it. We've got to figure out the economic model so the farmer is not the one bearing uh, all the costs of, of those additional requirements. And we haven't found that yet. You know, I talked to a food company uh, and I, I don't want to name names because we have investors on. And I asked, I said, okay, if, if this farmer is going to have regenerative oats for your product, are you going to pay a premium for doing all these various practices? And, and right now they say, we're not willing to pay a premium. It's more, if you want to have a buyer, these are the requirements uh, that we have for, for our growers. Thank you. So you had a chart earlier that showed that price, uh, food prices in the U.S. are materially uh, cheaper. Uh, than they are in the rest of the world and we have some members who have lived in europe uh, have lived in japan and I, I think they are agreeing with that and the question is how long uh, will it continue and if so for how long i i, I don't i don't see it uh, changing unless we structurally change uh, you know our our entire food supply chain i mean we've captured the economies of scale uh, in you know and allowing you know very efficient you know businesses so I don't, I don't env envision it changing uh, dramatically at all. I think uh, the only thing that that could really change it, I think, is is uh, you know if we want to take this step towards you know regenerative ag, more sustainable practices done on the farm, somebody's going to need to pay for it. And I think ultimately the consumer's going to have to pay if you if you want all of these you know extra features, uh, so to speak. Uh, that's the only thing I could see really fundamentally changing the cost of food in the U.S. Great, thank you. So our last question, it, it, it's a little bit broad based, but I think you, you will give some very um, in, insightful color and commentary. Can you discuss the challenges of uh, farming life or rural life? And they're asking specifically uh, access to rural broadband, rural food security and rural uh, health care, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic? Sure, sure. And, and I think food insecurity in the United States is going to be highest in rural areas. When you talk about how far people need to travel to a grocery store, for example. So uh, that's, you know, that's something that that continues to be an issue uh, on the rural broadband side. I mean, there's there's been a lot of efforts to get broadband across the country into rural America. I think, you know, we need to get the resources allocated to do so. Uh, you know, during this COVID-19 pandemic, when people are having to do distance learning, uh, but if you don't have internet, uh, you know, students are going to the McDonald's to get Wi-Fi in the parking lot to do homework. And that's only been made more challenging with everyone uh, leaning on that infrastructure uh, to do business today. So I think rural broadband continues to be an issue. And then access to healthcare, uh, you know, when you have farm communities that are in rural communities that are losing jobs, uh, you can't you can't support uh, the healthcare infrastructure that you need. So you're losing hospitals. Uh, you have mental health issues across rural America. We we've, we've been doing a lot of work on 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 that issue. But in order to have a strong and vibrant rural economy, you need access to healthcare, you need access to broadband, and we need better infrastructure. We've got uh, crumbling roads and bridges across the country. So we've been working on, on infrastructure investments as well. Great. Thank you for that response. So Dr. John Newton, thank you very much for an insightful conversation, for spending time with the GIC community. Uh, I hope you'll come back and join us for a future webcast. Well, I look forward to it. I hope that uh, Camp Kotak gets back up and running next year. I'm looking forward to that. Well, we'd, we'd, we'd love to be fishing with you. So look forward to that as well. Please be safe. Thank you. So audience, before we close, a quick reminder about two programs, uh, and this will wrap up our summer program through the end of July. So next Thursday on July 16th, uh, join us for a fireside chat with Dr. Charles Evans, the president and CEO 
of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, who will be discussing the Fed's monetary policy stance. Then on July 23rd, we will host Dr. Stephen Cicchetti of Brandeis University and Paul O'Brien, the former chief investment officer of the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, who will analyze and critique the approach uh, that central banks are taking. Finally, a feature of the David R. Kotak Global Healthcare Series is that Mr. Kotak has established a very generous matching donation challenge. So through the end of this month, any donations made will be matched dollar for dollar up to $50,000. So in other words, your donation of $250 becomes $500 in value and impact. All donations will go directly towards bringing high quality content as a public service for the remainder of the year from the GIC in terms of the executive briefing. If you wanna learn more about membership to the GIC or take advantage of the donation match, please go to the GIC website at www.interdependence.org. As we conclude, I encourage you to take 60 seconds to respond to our audience survey. Let us know how we can improve the program. Your feedback is very important to us. Thank you very much for your attention and good afternoon.